The School of Athens, the famous monumental fresco, painted by Raphael in the Vatican's Apostolic Palace. To many it symbolizes the absolute peak of the revival of the ancient classics during the Renaissance, not only artistically, but also in terms of meaning and symbolism. In this video essay, I will give you an analysis of the artistic, philosophical and historical context, not only of this fresco, but of the other major fresco called the Disputation of the Holy Sacrament as well, simply because its relation to the School of Athens fresco is of crucial importance in order to understand the true message of the artworks. And despite the fact that this is often what happens, understanding the artwork should and cannot be sought by looking at the School of Athens alone, and I will explain to you why. Let's start off with a short history of the room in which these two frescoes were painted, called the Stanza della Segnatura, as it will reveal what the original intent was for these masterworks. It was commissioned in the first decade of the 16th century by Pope Julius II. The room was to be part of his library and private office. At first he hired multiple artists at once to work together on a variety of his rooms. But when he saw the propositions made by Raphael, he was so incredibly impressed by the beauty and talent of his works, he immediately fired the other artists so that Raphael would be the sole artist and architect of the rooms. Now the Pope himself gave the subjects and ideas that Raphael had to base his works on. They were to be a synthesis of both Neoplatonic and Aristotelian thought, reconciled with Christianity, expressed by three core ideals that they had in common. Truth, good and beauty. These were to be divided over five frescoes in the room, the four walls and the ceiling. These frescoes were all painted in such a way that they seemed to extend the room itself and make it more spacious. We will now take a look at the two most important frescoes and analyze the portrayed ideal of truth which has been split up onto the two opposing walls. The first fresco and the most famous one is called the School of Athens, portraying the rational truth or philosophical truth. Through an exposition of the most important figures in ancient Greek thought under one roof and one academy. The magnificent hall of the school of the fresco also has a specific architectural form. It looks like the nave of a great church. It was, in fact, in the form of the new basilica of St. Peter, designed by Raphael's teacher, Donato Bramante, and begun three years before the painting of the frescoes of the Stanza, in 1506. The figures under this roof are found conversing, discussing and stating their most fundamental ideas. Some are pondering individually, others vividly debate their theories in groups, or explain them to listeners. In the center we find the two most influential and important figures in perhaps all of philosophy, Plato and Aristoteles. It is the duality and oppositions in and between their philosophies that characterize the heart of Western philosophy. Plato points his hand upwards towards the skies, towards the realm of ideas and perfect forms, symbolizing his focus on abstract thought. But Aristoteles has his hand lowered and points towards the earth symbolizing his focus on ethics and more practical thought, the realm of the empirical. This duality of the abstract and material, the ethereal and corporeal, is symbolized not only by the philosophers themselves, but also constitutes the center of the fresco in the sense of artistic composition. In addition to this, it is often noted that the color of the robes that they wear also point to the blue of the heavens above and the brown earthly soil beneath. To amplify this duality even further, Plato is painted holding his work Timaeus in his hand, which outlines his ideas on metaphysics and the purpose of the cosmos, while Aristoteles holds his work Ethica in his hand, which contains his ideas on ethics and virtue. Let's see who else we can find under the roof of this most renowned academy. On the far left we find Zeno of Kition, the founder of the school of Stoic philosophy, influencing thinkers such as Epictetus, Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. Next to him we find his direct opponent Epicurus, who was known for his ideas on materialism, hedonism, joy and happiness, contrasted to the philosophy of Zeno which focused more on discipline, virtue and living according to the inherent logic of the universe. Below these two giants of Greek philosophy we find another, Pythagoras, who influenced both Plato and Aristoteles, and therefore all of Western philosophy, 
but is most notably known for his key contributions to mathematics, physics, music and numerology, many of which are still directly employed until this day. Above we find Socrates, the direct teacher of Plato, mostly remembered for his method of philosophy, the Socratic method which stimulates critical thinking through dialectical questioning and self-examination, touching the very essence of philosophy itself. In the front we find Heraclitus, known for his ideas about the unity of opposites, harmony and material change in the universe. A little to the right of him we find the founder of cynicism, Diogenes, sitting alone on the stairs, a fitting image for the indifferent thinker who often slept naked in tubs, went around barefoot and often pulled philosophical stunts such as walking around with a lamp during the day, mocking Alexander the Great and stating that living like a dog was a form of virtue. But above all, he was a monumental thinker, who influenced almost every Greek school of thought, and saw virtue in action as the highest good compared to virtue in theory. In the top right corner we find Plotinus, the founder of Neoplatonic thought in the 3rd century, and because of this became one of the major influences on Christian thought later on. At the bottom right we find another giant of mathematics and geometry, Euclides, mostly known for his monumental work called Elements, in which he exposits and proves some of the most foundational theorems, propositions and theories in all of Western mathematics and logical thinking. As it is the oldest treatise known on the subject, it would be impossible to imagine modern science without this most fundamental thinker. He is portrayed after the image of Raphael's direct teacher, Donato Bramante, the most important architect of the High Renaissance style. Next to him we find Claudius Ptolemaeus, among others an astronomer, geographer and musical theorist of the 2nd century, whose works were of critical importance in the continuation of Greek thought and knowledge through the Islamic, Byzantine and Holy Roman Empires in the medieval era. There is one man who stares in the eye of the viewer as it were, and this man is Raphael himself. The man he is supposed to portray is Apelles, considered to be the greatest and most famous painter of ancient Greece. A perfect example of the confidence and self-glory with which the great Raphael contended himself, like so many other Renaissance painters and the generations after them would do too. So what does this fresco in particular mean? Or in other words, what do all these great thinkers have in common? What is it that unites these philosophers who hold such opposing ideas and contradicting theories? The one thing that they have in common is that they all confound their philosophies on one single thing. The love for wisdom, rationality, logic. They were all one by one more or less looking for the laws of life, nature, the universe, the very code of existence and being, truth. As I said before, this fresco represents the rational philosophical truth. Truth is in this way attained by logical reasoning, and it is this very method, the so-called Logos, which in ancient Greek thought became known as the divine reason, that opens the way to truth for us. So if on one side of the room the philosophical truth can be found, then what is being portrayed on the other side of the room? On the other side we find a fresco called the Disputation of the Most Holy Sacrament. This represents the supernatural truth, or theological truth, the other method or tool to come to truth itself, in which God and the mysticism of the Blessed Sacrament, the Eucharist, stand central and embody the supernatural version of the truth. But let's first take a look at the composition and what we can see before we analyze the meaning of the artwork. The main composition consists of two layers, representing the division between heaven and earth. In the top layer we find the Holy Trinity in the center, with God the Father above, Jesus Christ the Son in the middle, and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove below them. Beside him are the Blessed Virgin Maria and John the Baptist. Sitting on the row beneath the throne we can find Saint Peter all the way to the left, holding the keys of heaven, the absolute symbol of the Roman Catholic Church and the Vatican. And next to him Adam still half naked after eating from the fruit in the Garden of Eden, but also Saint John the Evangelist, one of the major writers of the Bible, and Saint Lawrence who was martyred under Emperor Valerian. On the other side we find the Jewish priest Judas Maccabeus, in full golden armor. Next to him is seated Saint Stephen, the first Christian martyr, alongside Moses, holding the Ten Commandments in his hands. We then find Saint James the Elder, 
and Abraham holding the knife that symbolizes the relationship of mankind with God, and at the end St. Paul with a sword, which he is usually portrayed with because of his martyrdom in Rome. Not only do the four writers of the Gospels appear in this layer, but the Gospels themselves as well. The four texts can be found next to the Holy Spirit. For example, the fourth book that Raphael painted shows the famous opening lines of the Gospel of John, in principio erat verbum, in the beginning was the word, or even more fitting to the meaning of the fresco on the other side of the room, the translation of the word verbum from the Greek text. In the beginning was the logos. In the bottom layer on earth, we find the monstrance in the center, displaying the Eucharist, the memorial and communion of the death, body and blood, and resurrection of Christ, the blessed sacrament. Around the monstrance are seated the four church fathers of Catholicism, Pope Gregory is the Great, famed for his mission sent out to convert the pagan Anglo-Saxons to Christianity, and above all for developing and consolidating early Christian liturgy and music. Saint Hieronymus, mostly known for his translations, interpretations and commentaries on the Bible. Saint Ambrosius, famous for his writings on ethics, Christian theological doctrine and musical harmony. And finally we find Saint Augustinus who developed many of the philosophies of the Catholic Church on sin, forgiveness and the creation of the universe to name a few, in which he was greatly influenced by the Neoplatonist movement, in the light of which he interpreted many texts of the Bible. Behind them stands Saint Thomas Aquinas, the most influential philosopher of medieval Europe and Christianity, influenced mainly by Aristoteles on ethics and his ideas about creation and the essence of objective reality. On the floor some of the church fathers their books can be found. We can find De Civitate Dei by Saint Augustinus, the Epistulae by Saint Geronimus, and the Liber Moralium by Pope Gregorius at the feet of its author. Another major figure that can be found in the crowd is Dante Alighieri, one of the most famous writers in all of Western history with his renowned Divina Commedia. There are, however, many non-Christian characters and references to be found as well. In fact, many of the others who can be found conversing and debating the Eucharist on the earthly layer are the thinkers and philosophers from the School of Athens, who have so to speak crossed the room and entered the fresco from the other side. Aristoteles can be seen from the back, as if he just walked in. Plato is already settled next to Saint Ambrosius and Augustinus. Both philosophers can still be seen maintaining the positions of their hands pointed to respectively earth and heaven just like they did in the school of Athens. Euclides can still be found on the left, looking up towards the church in the background, a nice reference considering his works on geometry and mathematics. So what does the layering in this fresco mean? What is the ecclesial community discussing and what is the relation to the other fresco, the school of Athens? The meaning itself was described extremely well by the Renaissance painter who gave the fresco its original name, Giorgio Vasari who wrote that on this fresco the ecclesial community of both heaven and earth was essentially depicted writing mass, by trying to understand and explore while debating the mystery and full meaning of communion, with each other and the great thinkers from ancient Greece, entrusted to them as the church between earth and heaven, between God and men. In this lies the essence of the fresco, in attaining truth through the supernatural, where truth in the school of Athens was incarnate through philosophy and rationality, in the disputation of the blessed sacrament, it is incarnate through theology and the Eucharist. That is the crucial link between the two. They are both portrayals of the path to truth. I also hope that you fully understand now that while these are two separate frescoes in the physical sense, they do form one vivid image and are connected on the one side through their meaning and that which they have in common, the search for truth and on the other side through the incorporation of the very room of the stanza into its most fundamental architectural design. It is therefore absolutely necessary to stand in between the two frescoes in the stanza itself to fully experience and become a part of this magnificent scene, a moving image instead of a frozen moment captured, to see on the one side the philosophers of old coming towards you, and on the other side seeing them enter a golden synthesis in which the blessed sacrament is disputed and revealed as truth incarnate and triumphs through the reconciliation and incorporation of the classics and Christianity through the church fathers, of philosophy and theology, of rationality and faith, 
that brought forth one of the most prosperous and advanced civilizations the world had ever seen. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you in my next video.